also welcome Reverend Jerry Troyer, a good friend of mine. He's been here before with us here at City of Light at our former location on Tully Road. It's been years since we've had the opportunity to really fellowship here in Atlanta, but we've been sharing wonderful experiences at the affiliated New Thought Network conferences. I'm delighted to take a moment to brag a little bit about him, if you'll indulge me, just because I want to say that we are sharing the good news of the affiliated New Thought Network and inviting congregations across Atlanta to join us. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to meet with another pastor and congregation that are also wanting to join the affiliated New Thought Network to, as we expand across the city of Atlanta, saying we want to be part of that. We're in dialogue with four different congregations joining with us in this wonderful network of nationwide of congregations. It's exciting. Atlanta will be the city with the most affiliated New Thought Network congregations in any city in the United States. Well, we already knew we were number one, right? So what we want to say is that it was a delight to have uh, Jerry as our representative of the Affiliated New Thought Network. His cordial, open spirit, his uh, helpful assistance in answering questions. It was just saying how easy it is to do this. Now, over the years, as a pastor for 42 years, I've been part of different denominations. And sometimes it's a struggle to knock on the door, to get in, to say, hello, hello, recognize me. How do I, what hoops do I have to jump through? How do I get a line? How do I get recognized? How does it happen? And he just makes it so simple and so easy. And I appreciate it. But that's the kind of spirit that he operates in. And that's what we love about the affiliated New Thought Network is that he is operating in the spirit of, well, the answer is yes. How do we make it happen? The answer is yes, that positive, welcoming experience. Now, along with that, he's been an author, and you may have his book. Several of you purchased it five or six years ago when he was here with us. Uh, he has a dynamic book, and he's been traveling around the United States sharing this uh, book uh, that helps us understand uh, homosexuality and the wonderful journey of truth within our lives and his own personal discovery. Along with that, then, he is also been a wonderful speaker and motivational inspiration across the United States, speaking in a wide variety of places and finding a home in San Diego, working with a spirit, own spiritual center in San Diego as well. So it's a delight to have him share with us and inspire us, speak to us from his heart. And today you're going to hear some very personal experiences as we answer these questions within our life. How do we deal with emotions? Uh, as being positive people? How do we work through them? How do we sustain the joy in the midst of greatest challenges? How do we find peace in the midst of the storm? You know, it's been always our question to say, how is it Jesus could be sleeping in the boat while the rest of the disciples are in fear and you know, turmoil as the boat is being tossed across the Sea of Galilee? Well, it's discovering how you find that continuity and consciousness. So with that, would you welcome Reverend Jerry Troyer with a round of applause, a good Southern welcome to him, saying thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Thank you, Paul. Let me just grab my stuff here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, City of Light. How awesome it is to be back with you after we were trying to figure out five or six or seven years. It's, it's been a long time. Last time, of course, you all were still down on Tully Road. Um, I br First of all, and most importantly, I bring you greetings and congratulations to our three beloved graduates from Emerson Theological Institute, as well as from the affiliated New Thought Network. It is such an honor to be with you this morning, and I thank Dr. Paul so much for the invitation and the opportunity. What a gorgeous place you have. This is just amazing. I congratulate you for that. What wonderful work you're doing with the homeless community. And as Dr. Paul mentioned, I'm director of shelter operations for Urban Street Angels, which is an organization in San Diego that works to get homeless youth ages 18 to 25 off the streets and into housing and employment. And we do that through a shelter twice a week where they can come in and get uh, necessary supplies and a good night's sleep. Uh, and then we also have a housing and employment program. And what we do is what you do, and what we, the collective we do, is offer unconditional love. If you boil it down, that's exactly what we're doing. 
which could very well be something that these people might not have ever experienced before, especially the 18 to 25-year-olds that aged out of, of foster care or um, were uh, thrown out of their home because they came out as gay or lesbian or there was no home to be in because there were drug issues or economic issues or, or, the, or whatever the reason is, but what we're offering is unconditional love, and it's so important, and I honor you for your work, your love, and your generosity in that program. So, Ty, David, and John, congratulations. You've made it. So from now on, life is wonderful. The Falcons will win. The Braves will win. You will part the 285 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon like Moses did with the Red Sea. All is well, right? In this teaching, we know the truth. The truth is we are one with all that is. All is well. We are abundant. We are perfect health. Everything is as it should be, etc., etc. And that is the truth. But the fact can be different. Somebody said the truth never changes, but the facts change. So how do we allow ourselves to deal with those experiences in our lives when, no, sorry, what is it, four lanes each way on the 285? Six lanes each way on the 285 and both lanes are crawling and you're late to work or an appointment or whatever. How do we deal with those experiences and allow ourselves to feel what we feel rather than just keep, oh no, no, everything is as it should be, all is well. Can we allow ourselves to do that? Can we allow ourselves to exist like a lotus at home in the muddy water? Thus we bow to life as it is. That's a Zen proverb that I absolutely love because this muddy water is what life is. Some days... <laughs> There's a country western song. Some days you're the windshield, some days you feel like the bug, right? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that for a while, but the truth is that sometimes, yeah, if you think about it, sometimes you are. Can we have inner peace in the midst of this muddy water? Can we allow ourselves to feel what we feel while still knowing the truth? Yes, we can. Bowing to life as it is. Life is about change. Life is wonder and joy and passion and abundance and fabulousness. And life is heartbreak and depression and fear, and worry, and loss. And if we're one with all that is, we're one with all that is. I'm so grateful to the people who were able to be with me yesterday for my workshop here at City of Light. Those of you that were here with me yesterday, please know you're, this is going to be a review, some of a review, but some, some new stuff as well. But if you're like I am, all of this I need to hear over and over again, so I bet you'll still, you'll still take something with you. I love the Golden Girls. If, you love, if you're a Golden Girls fan, raise your hand. Love it, love it, love it. I have a dear friend in Knoxville who is one of the moderators of the Golden Girls fans page on Facebook. So, I mean, he is just, it's in his, the marrow of his bones. And so we trade quotes from the shows on uh, uh, Instant Message or on Facebook. And I had the opportunity to visit him in Knoxville a few weeks ago. And, and we remarked that if we took the 
brain space, the gray matter space that we reserved for quotes from the girl, Golden Girls and erased it, we could cure cancer, solve world hunger, and do a few other things. But it's, it's a joy. We as human beings remember so much. And let me digress, first of all, and just apologize for not uh, having a black graduation robe with me this morning, but I'm from California. So, you know, we're just, we're a little different in California. So, so we'll blame it. We'll blame it on that. We remember the most amazing things. I bet you could recite the lyrics to the Pina Colada song. Yeah, Cad, if you, uh, yes. Yes, yes, getting caught in the rain, blah, 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 yeah. Probably useless information, but if it comes on the radio, you know, I'm right there and I bet you are as well. We remember those happy times, but we also remember the not so happy times, whether it was earlier this morning or last year or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago when we were going up, growing up. We remember those memories and those feelings and we carry them with us. Those memories and those feelings and those assumptions can affect the choices we make today if we don't allow ourselves to look at them, to feel them, to process them through and move forward. So can we experience this inner peace as we do this? The answer is, spoiler alert, absolutely. We can do this. So often we label our emotions as good or bad. And we did an exercise yesterday in the workshop where we had three buckets. And the first bucket, we put our bad or negative emotions. Anger, hurt, worry, fear, doubt. We put those in our negative emotions bucket. And then we put joy and wonder and passion and delight and hope and the other things like that in our good emotion bucket. And then we drew two lines from our bad emotions and our good emotions into our third bucket, which was just emotions. Shakespeare, I think it was Shakespeare that said, "'Tis neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so." But how often do we feel something happens and we feel the beginnings of anger or hurt or disappointment or whatever, and we should on ourselves. I shouldn't feel that way. It's all is well, and they did the best they could, and all of those other things. And we negate, we squash those feelings because they're bad. But what if they weren't? What if they're just part of this experience that we're having? If, the, if there were a way to take a word out of the dictionary and send it into space, I believe that word would be should. How often do we should on ourselves? You know, I should go to the gym this afternoon. I should not have that second piece of chocolate cake. I should go to church. See, that's the exception. You should go to church. Every, everything else, every, every, everything else is, is iffy. But, but think about the thoughts that we have about what we should do, and chances are, if we think we should do it, it's probably something that we don't want to do. But yet, we feel like we need to for whatever reason. This is different. I've been in, in New Thought and Religious Science for about 25 years, and this is a little different than what I was taught, and different than than what I grew up in this teaching with. And the, and the reason that it came to light in my life, I am convinced, is that my husband of 33 years made his transition last October. And he did so in he had, uh, stage four colon cancer and um, was not doing well, but it was the Anson Conference last year at Unity Village, and he really wanted to go with me. And so he was very weak and was in a wheelchair, but he went with me 
got worse, so we left early to go home, and he actually died in the airport in Houston on the connection to go back to San Diego. <sighs> wow. And it, uh, denial is a wonderful thing, and I just kept thinking, you know, we'll get home, we'll get you, you know, uh, we'll get you... He was having um, challenges with his liver. We'll do the drain. We'll get we'll we'll get that drained. You'll feel better. We'll get you to some holistic people because the doctors had basically said there's not much more we can do for you. You know, there, there's still a way. But he was a registered nurse and absolutely knew I think that it was getting ready to be time. And I believe at some level we have some say in when it's time for us to go. So he in the airport. I I left him. I went to go check on the seat assignments, and when I came back, he was unresponsive, and they got him, got his heart going, transported him, uh, but he uh, died in the, at, actually at the, at the hospital, uh, the hospital closest to the airport in Houston. My beloved uh, loved to be the center of attention, and so as, as I'm standing in the airport with the EMTs all around him and people looking, I said, Jerry, his name was Jerry also, Jerry Lee Collins, you're actually going to do this and die in the airport. And it is, it is exactly as he would have wanted because he was truly the center of attention in that moment. But what happened for me was this grief and this sadness and this feeling of loss following almost immediately by my ego saying, mm, mm, mm. Everything is as it should be. Everything is in divine order. He's in a better place. All of those things that we say to try to feel better. But what do I do with this grief? What do I do with this sadness? How do I allow myself to feel what I feel? There's a concept that's called toxic positivity. Toxic positivity. You might have heard of it. And it's talking with someone, including ourselves, about life. And rather than allowing us to feel what we feel and say what we need to say, no, no, don't worry, be happy. I don't want to. I don't want to be happy. I want to worry. I'm concerned about this. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about this. Good vibes only. Do we allow ourselves to feel this? To What does it mean if we, we do our affirmative prayer, we do our spiritual mind treatment, and we say, and so it is? Yes, but what if it isn't? What if it doesn't happen? Do we allow ourselves to feel that, to recognize that's just part of our experience, but then move forward from there. Never give up. Sometimes we need to give up. Have, have you ever experienced the cosmic two by four, in a especially in a job where I had that, it's time to find a new job. You really want to find a new job. Wouldn't you like to find a new job and then I was lovingly released from that job, which is way better than saying laid off. And the universe spirit is like, well, I told you the cosmic two by four. It was time for me to give up and go find a new job, but I held on. And that happens so often in our relationships, whatever that relationship is, with another person, with a job, just that car, what is that noise? I really need to think about a new car. And the car finally says at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the 285 in the left-hand lane, I give up. <laughs> See, it's your fault the traffic is so slow on the 285. See the good in everything. Yes, there is good in everything. And I'll get there. But in the midst of the mud... Sometimes we have to allow ourselves to feel what we feel, to feel that grief, to feel that loss. 
a dear a dear friend of mine who is also one of the volunteers at my shelter said because I was I was sharing the the story of my husband's passing and that we've been together for 33 years and she said how incredibly fortunate you were to have 33 years together because so many people don't and that really touched my heart and I thought to myself yes we were and I should oops there's that word I should be grateful and I am grateful but I'm also greedy and I wanted more so yes we're grateful for whatever it was but we also get to feel that sense of grief and that sense of loss the I don't like the word challenge the opportunity when we look at this toxic positivity is to feel what we feel and to recognize when we're getting angry about our anger, when we're feeling grief about our grief, when we're feeling shame about our shame, and we could be here the rest of the afternoon, but you get the crux of this. Do we allow ourselves to feel this? And this is this has to do with a change of a relationship. And, and Mary Morrissey wrote that relationships never end because the relationship is always in our minds but it just, the dynamics change. So my relationship with my Jerry is different because his physical being is no longer here. So that changed. A relationship with, uh, with a boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, husband, wife could change and they're no longer in your life. The relationship with an employer changes and ideally over time you forgive them for whatever it was and allow yourself to move forward. And I was going someplace with that, but that'll come back. Toxic positivity and our beating ourselves up for feeling what we feel. There is also spiritual bypass. And this, you're going to laugh. I hope you laugh. Spiritual bypass and the byline is avoidance in holy drag. Don't you love that? This is from the book, Spiritual Bypassing, When Spirituality Disconnects Us from What Really Matters. And this has to do with emotional numbing and repression, overemphasis on the positive, anger phobia, blind or overly tolerant compassion, weak or too porous boundaries. Do we allow ourselves, and we talked about this earlier in the service, if we're spiritual beings having a human experience, do we allow ourselves to have that human experience? Do we allow ourselves to look back at our experience growing up? Maybe it wasn't a Hallmark card. Maybe it wasn't a Norman Rockwell painting. And if you don't know who Norman Rockwell is, I don't want to hear about it. But for the rest of us, you remember you know, that the family, it's father and mother and 2.6 children and the dog and the cats and the white picket fence and everything is lovely. And if your experience wasn't that way, what do we go through on Mother's Days and Father's Days in, in anger and guilt and regret that our experience wasn't that way? Do we allow ourselves to, to feel regret for that and, and feel loss for that? If you went through an experience where you didn't have mother and father at home, and maybe you were raised by grandparents, or maybe you were adopted, do we allow ourselves to process that through, to feel the loss, to feel the feelings, and then come out the other side and move forward? Do we allow ourselves to do that? Or do we stay in spiritual bypass? Do we allow ourselves to be at home in the mud? Can we include it all in our hearts? Can we include? We are, we are about inclusivity. We include others of different backgrounds, sexual orientations, ethnicity, those things. Can we also include all of these attributes of who we are as human beings? If not, 
as Debbie Ford wrote, and if you've not had the opportunity, Debbie Ford is one of my favorite authors. I really encourage you to look for her writings. One of the, in one of the books, she wrote, what we can't be with won't let us be. If we can't be with that, yes, that's what happened as I was growing up. Yes, that's what happened when I came out to my parents. Yes, that's what happened with that job or that relationship. If we can't allow ourselves to be with that, to look at that, those emotions, and process them through, they won't let us be. And so often we make choices in life and judgments based on those experiences that we've not given ourselves the opportunity to look at. We have to allow ourselves to grieve. I believe that any time we don't get what we wanted, there is that feeling of grief. And it might be when it's when someone dies, when there's a loss of some kind, but it's also when we are, when we feel betrayed, when we feel lied to, when we when when something happens again, just not as we would have wished, there's the opportunity to grieve that, to process it without the platitudes, without all of that. This, you, you might be familiar with uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's writing, and she, she writes about the stages of grief having to do with denial, anger, bargaining, repression, acceptance, finally acceptance, and then I add sadness. And my experience has been, because it's been uh, almost 11 months. It was October 17th, so almost 11 months since my husband passed. And I think I've just about gotten past the grieving part. And this, if you've had this experience with a, with a spouse or a child or, or someone close to you, we get, maybe we get past the grieving, we get past the acceptance, and we're just left with sadness. I need to tell him about that. I need to ask him about that. Oh, he would love this. So we just get into that, navigate, we're able to move forward, but we have that sadness, and it's okay. And not only is it okay, but it's necessary for us to allow ourselves to feel what we do. Sometimes we fall into the trap, and this is new news for me, Sometimes we fall into the trap of premature forgiveness. Now, everybody's doing the best they can. Everybody, uh, the Course in Miracles says, everyone and everything leans toward me to bless me, even though it certainly doesn't look like a blessing at the time. That's my words, not from the Course in Miracles. You know, just, just all of those, and, and we allow ourselves to, to hear that and to feel that. But do we offer forgiveness before we're ready? I shared the story yesterday, uh, a friend of Jerry's, that he went through a period of using crystal meth and had a terrible time, but went through recovery, did a six-month uh, six outpatient uh, experience, came out the other side, totally rebuilt, stayed clean, totally rebuilt his life, went and got a new job, better than the one he had before, and just was ama just amazing. He was absolutely my hero for that. And a friend of his that he met in recovery then became a friend of mine. He stayed with us for a few months several years ago and needed a place last August, so he came and moved in with us. And it was wonderful to have him there because he was there in the last days and helped me um, take care of Jerry as I needed to was there after I got home when he passed, and so was there with for, uh, to be somebody to cry with, to talk with, and so forth. But as Jerry was able to get and stay clean and sober, this friend was not. And so he's been in my house, and he's relapsed three times since October. And so last Sunday, I came home from church and found him. And if you've ever used or you know of someone who uses meth tends to make you really jumpy and kind of bounce off the walls. And so he was there bouncing off the walls and he'd had a blow up with his boyfriend and so on and so on. And I said, before my head kicked in, before
before my heart kicked in, I said, get out of my house. And it took him a couple of hours, but he called a friend and they came in and he came and got him and got his stuff and got out. So I'm calling the locksmith to change the locks. I'm changing the, the code on the garage door. And my ego is saying, what's he going to do? You should be more, there's that word again, you should be more compassionate. Maybe you should give him another chance. Maybe you should give him some money so that he'll be okay. Followed by the still small voice of spirit saying, no. Everything is as it should be. You need to stand in your truth. And yes, you need to forgive, but you need to allow yourself to process that through first because there is anger. Do we allow ourselves to get angry? Or do we come from that old school that somehow you're not supposed to? That's to use a purely spiritual term that and, st and not be thrown out of this church. That's hogwash. If you don't get angry, if you never get angry, I need to pinch you because there are things we have to allow ourselves to feel what we feel. And when we are betrayed, when we are lied to, when there is a situation, we have to allow ourselves to feel that so that we can move forward. So I'm not forgiving yet. I will, but not yet. So what happens to this grief, to these feelings, this anger, this hurt, this resentment, whatever it is, if we don't allow ourselves to feel it? I believe that's where road rage comes from. You know? Just everything's lovely, and then somebody cuts you off, and you just go after them, because it was the final straw. And it wasn't their fault, but it's all that anger that we hadn't processed yet. A dear friend of mine was a um, psychiatrist, psychologist, one of them, and he talked about not processing our emotions, and what happens is we cash in our stamp books. Now, again, if you don't know about blue chip, or SNH green stamps, or any of those. If you don't know about those, I don't want to hear about it. But for the rest of us, before there was, you know, you put your card in the slot at the grocery store and it, they are your phone number in, and you get the points and you can use them for discounts on gas and so forth, there were trading stamps. And so remember, and, 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 thank, thank you. Oh, I feel so much better. Thank you. So we'd go and you'd buy something and you'd get a sheet of stamps and you'd paste them in the book and that's how my parents got the TV trays and they got the toaster oven and they got some pretty cool stuff. But what happens is if we don't allow ourselves to feel what we feel, instead of it, we get a stamp. And we stamp it, we place it on the page in the book. And we keep collecting stamps, and we keep collecting stamps, and then one day you go to work and somebody says, gee, you look tired, didn't you get enough sleep last night? And you just explode. What do you mean I look tired? I worked for 45 minutes to get my makeup on to look halfway decent this morning. I, I'm doing the best I can. I can't believe you said that. Completely out of the blue, unprocessed stuff, again, using purely a medic physical term here, that unprocessed stuff that has to come out someplace. Road rage, substance abuse, what we can't be with won't let us be, and so we have to find an outlet for it or a way to cover it up, and so we look for other ways. So how do we process it? And there's a whole long list, and uh, we have to be other places, so I won't go through the whole list. But journaling, talking with someone else, finding a support group, noticing what we're noticing. And every time we start to have that thought of it's all rainbows and puppy dogs and all is well, 
It is, but we also get to feel what we feel so that we can be at home in the muddy water. Because if we're waiting, if we're working for the weekend, and it, again, if you don't remember this song by Loverboy, I don't want to hear about it, but for the rest of us, remember, everybody's working for the weekend, and how often are we? I'll be a success as soon as I get that next degree, as soon as I get that next promotion, as soon as, and you get to as, lose another 20 pounds, at whatever, you, whatever you choose it, postponing joy postponing our approval of ourselves means that we never get there because there's always something else. In this moment, just exactly as we are with all of our feelings and emotions, we are the essence, expression, and experience of spirit. Right here in this, right, this red hot second, in this moment, nothing needs to be changed, nothing needs to be denied. That's who we are. That's all of us. That's the truth of us. So we include it all. So I, I would like to close with a quote from this wonderful book, Spiritual Bypassing. So I invite you to just take a deep breath if you'd like, get comfortable in your chair, and give me just one second here. So turn toward your negativity. Stop pathologizing it. Stop relegating it to lower status. Stop keeping it in the dark. Go to it. Open its doors and windows. Take it by the hand. Meet its gaze. Feel its woundedness. Feel into it. Feel for it. Feel it without any buffers. Soon you will start to sense that its gaze is none other than your own, perhaps from an earlier time, but yours nonetheless, containing so much of you. Humanize it fully, keeping something in the dark long enough, and it will probably behave badly. Turn on the lights, slowly but surely. Your simple presence is enough. Let your heart soften. Breathe a little more deeply, bringing what you call your negativity closer to you, opening at a fitting place. No rush. Let it shift, however slowly, from a distant foreign object to a reclaimed part of your being. Let its pain and longing break your heart. Your ambition to transcend your negativity is now all but gone as you realize right to your core that your true work is to reclaim it and re-embody it. You are with yourself more deeply now, your initial aversion all but gone, and now hold what you previously termed your negativity in the way that loving parents hold their distressed child, bringing it into your heart feeling a rising desire and power to protect that little one. No negativity now, just love, ease, recognition, presence, effortless wholeness. This is life in the raw, too real to be reduced to positive and negative, too alive to be shut down. So in the peace and the quiet of this moment, we allow ourselves to be reminded that there's only one power, presence, mind, life, and intelligence, and that is God. Spirit, the universe, the infinite, the divine, whatever we choose to call it. And we give great thanks for the opportunity to be together today. We give thanks for this thing called life. With all of its joys and wonders, and hurts and irritations, and fears and doubts, all of it. And we allow ourselves to be reminded that we are one with all of life, so we are one with all of that. It's part of who we are, and not only is it okay, but it's necessary. We honor ourselves, we love ourselves as the essence, expression, and experience of spirit. For this wonderful place, for the work, the amazing work in the community, for the love that we share, for this beloved community, we give great thanks.
And together we say, and so it is. Thanks, y'all.